so good to see everyone here as we continue our worship to the one true living God. Thank you so much for being here. The prayer list from this morning. Uh, continue to remember Miss Sandra Williams, Miss Peggy Wade, um, the family of Larry Scheider. This is a, a father of a Heather Chance's friend who died last week. Uh, Cindy Walton, friends of uh, James and Teresa Kitchens, recovering from some surgery she had. Uh, Greg Tinker, everybody knows him as Coach Tinker in the uh, city school or Jasper City School system. Uh, some some tests last week uh, showing that his cancer, I think, had come back. So let's remember Greg Tinker. Uh, Kenneth Wright, this is Leslie's dad, uh, with a heart procedure coming up this week. Um, Keith and Kathy's cousin. James Mullinax is in a hospital. Uh, Ryan wanted me to mention him this morning. And of course, uh, Tuesday night, uh, remember, be here at 6 o'clock, hear Daniel speak to us. Glad that Daniel's going to be speaking to us about the topic of Abraham. Appreciate uh, Donnie, Donnie's uh, wonderful lesson last week on uh, Rahab. So many good points that he had there, and I appreciate him doing that. So for we've done well for a Tuesday night summer series, and thank you so much for all the men that's uh, willing to step up and do those lessons. It, uh, for me, it took about uh, two and a half, three weeks to talk for thirty seconds, I mean thirty minutes. So uh, I have all new appreciation, of course, for Joey and those men that's preaching the gospel and able to put together a sermon like they do. But. Uh, Edward's going to be uh, leading us in a singing here in just a little bit. Ronnie Jones will do our opening prayer. And then at close, we'll ask Brother Hugh Plotter if he would close us out in prayer. I don't think there's any other announcements. So uh, let's start our worship service. sing two songs before I have our opening prayer and the first song is number 53 53 first and fourth verse <laughs> hear me when I call oh God my righteousness unto thee I come and we this and distressed hold my trembling hand lest hell as I should fall oh hear me Lord hear me oh hear me when I call hear my prayer oh God cleansing power let me feel thee near each moment of each hour oh my trembling hand lest help as I should fall oh hear me Lord hear me Next song is 799. 799, walking along in the evening. First and third verse. Walking along at Eve and viewing the skies afar, bidding the darkness come to welcome each silver star. I have a great delight in the wonderful saints above. God in his power and might it showing his truth and love. Oh, for home with God, no place in his courts to rest. Sure to safe abode with Jesus and the blessed rest for weary soul once 
redeemed by the Savior's love. Where I'll be pure and whole and live with my God above. Closing my eyes at eve and thinking of heaven's grace. Longing to see my Lord, yes, meeting him face to face. Trusting him as my all, wheresoever my footsteps roam. Pleading with him to guide me on to the Spirit's home. Oh, for a home with God, a place in his courts to rest. Sure and a safe abode with Jesus and the blessed. Rest for a weary soul was redeemed by the Savior's love. Where I be pure and whole and live with my God above. Now we have our opening prayer. Let us pray at this time. Our Father in heaven, it is again we thank thee for this Lord's Day evening. We're so thankful that you have allowed us to come out to this place and worship you, the one true and living God. We're so thankful that you sent your Son to this world to die, to shed his body, to shed his blood, to purchase this congregation as well as the church throughout the world. We know that the church is his body, and he is the head of the body and the savior of the body. We know that when we obey the gospel, that he himself adds us to this body, the church. We pray for that I would be with this congregation that meets here from time to time, that we might go around doing much good for this community, that we might do much good in spreading the gospel to this community and even to all the world. We pray that I would be with us as we strive to help the widows and orphans and those who need help. Pray that we might always be ready to help those who are in need. We're so mindful of those that Rick has uh, announced that were sick. Pray that I would be with them and those who have lost loved ones, be with them. We know there's those here that uh, by reason of age or by reason of sickness, have health problems. Pray that I would be with the members here who, who need your help, uh, whether in body or mind, that they might be healed. We pray especially for those that are facing surgery or that have had surgery. We pray that I would be with them and restore them back to their wanted health and bless the surgeons and nurses and those who would take care of them. We ask thee to, to be mindful of this country, be mindful that uh, we have a democracy and pray that I would be with this nation, that we might remain a democracy so that we might come and worship thee and praise thee in places such as this congregation here at Parish. Pray that I would be with us now as we listen to Joy's sermon. Pray that he might preach in such a way we might understand it and we might learn much what will help us have a home in heaven when this life is over. Forgive us of our sins and give us a good night in our service. It is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. The invitation song tonight is 913. 913 is an invitation song, and the song before Brother Joy speaks to us is 586. 586, more about Jesus, first and fourth verse. Mm -hmm. More about Jesus would I know, more of his grace to others show, more of his saving fullness see, more of his love who died for me. More, more about Jesus, more, more about Jesus, more of his saving fullness see, 
more of his love who died for me. More about Jesus on his throne, riches and glory all his own. More of his kingdom sure increase, more of his coming prince of peace. More, more about Jesus, more, more about Jesus. More of his saving fullness see, more of his love who died for me. Now, Brother Joy. Hello and good evening. It is so good to see each and every one of you tonight. It's always a joy to be together as brothers and sisters in Christ. And what a way to close out this first day of the week and as we propel ourselves into a new week ahead. I think as we'll see tonight, this study of James chapter 3 is going to be as helpful as any for the rest of the night, but also practically tomorrow and Tuesday and whatever days we go through this week. So if you want to be turning in your New Testament to the book of James, James chapter 3, that's the book that we're reading and rereading through over the course of um, this week in our Bible reading together. One announcement that I briefly mentioned to Rick this morning that we kind of did forget, and we'll, we'll keep hammering it in the weeks to come, but uh, there's a sign-up sheet for the Birmingham Barons game that we'll go to as church families Friday night, July 16th. Friday night, July 16th. Right now, if we can get over 20 uh, people to go, that will be a $10 ticket. So you can sign up for those. You can begin paying for those. And the deadline for those will be Sunday, July 11th. So there's a sheet out there for Friday night, July 16th, Barron's Game in Birmingham, downtown stadium there. We'll have a great time together. If we just survey some news stories over the past really a few weeks, a lot of these, but some of them go back to last year. Just notice and kind of see, you probably could figure it out pretty quickly, but just see kind of where all these end up after we look at all seven. Medina Spirit won the 2021 Kentucky Derby just a few, I guess last month, the month of May, but has since been disqualified. Did not win the Kentucky Derby now because they found that its owner was doping that horse. And so that owner, Bob Baffert, has now been suspended for two years, the longest, strictest ban that they could hand it down to an owner. It's the first time the Kentucky Derby winner has been disqualified after winning since 1968. I think just this past week or so, more than 40 African migrants were rescued after their boat ran aground on the rocky coast in the Canary Islands that belonged to Spain. I believe six died. Others were rescued and arrived safely in other boats, but they were traveling and they ran aground. Their ship crashed into those islands off the coast of Spain. You may remember last year, the 2020 California wildfire labeled the El Dorado wildfire, Southern California, burned some 22,744 acres. It destroyed 10 structures, including four homes. It damaged six, damaged six others. It caused one fatality, that of a firefighter. Remember how this one started? It started by a small pyrotechnic device used at a gender reveal party. Right now, there are 15 wild elephants all traveling together in a pack across China. They've been at it since last year. They've covered ground of over 300 miles. It's estimated they've eaten over a million dollars worth of crops. Even some comical reports that one of them got into some fermented wheat and was acting intoxicated and drunk on their journey. Right now, there's beginning to be concerns because they're getting near a city that is home to 8.5 million people. And they're trying to lure it away, lure this pack of elephants away from the city by by using food to guide them away from the city. But now there are concerns. What happens if they head toward the city and people become in danger? How will they handle? Will they have to euthanize or shoot these elephants if they become a threat 
to the human beings in that city. The poisoning case in Russia continues to develop. It came to light in August of 2020 when the, the main party rep uh, Russian opposition figure, so he's opposing the main party, he's anti-corruption activist Alexei Navalny, one of the key um, enemies of President Putin over there. He was poisoned with a nerve agent, almost died in the hospital. And now even this week, news is broken that the U.S. has threatened legal or threatened sanctions because of their use of this nerve agent. Within the past month, 85,600 people, residents of Flint, Michigan, have signed up for the allocated $641 million settlement, settlement that resulted from the 2014 water crisis when the Flint River contaminated the water supply. It's a city of about 95,000 people, and 85,000 have applied for that relief. And then ending on good news, a young man named Mihir Anand of Glenora, California, recently developed an organization called Fruitful Years, and he goes through and he finds fruit that's fallen off of trees and bushes. It's on the ground, but it's still edible, and he collects all of that surplus. It's not being used, and he finds a way to repurpose it to those in need in various ways. Finding fruit that grows on those trees and bushes. Now, these are seven different word pictures. What it reminds us of is that the seven word pictures James used some 2,000 years ago to remind us of the importance and even the dangers of our tongues are as extremely relevant today as they were when he first used them. And likewise, it's also the case that the warnings about how to use our tongues is just as relevant today as it was when James first wrote them 2,000 years ago. And now we have the added element of digital technology and social media which also would qualify a lot of these things, these warnings that James gives here in James chapter 3. How much do we respect the dangers of the tongue and of our speech? And do we understand it's fundamental that the damage that is spread from our tongues is always exponential? We never speak our words into a vacuum and no one else hears them. We speak them to be heard. And so they either inflict damage to other people or they are inflicting damage about other people. And often it doesn't stop with the people to whom we speak. It continues and burns from that point forward. And so the use, the misuse of our tongues not only inflicts damage to our own souls, but always results in collateral damage in the lives of others. Now, to set up this chapter in this section, I think it's important to start in chapter 1, actually. Just listen carefully to James 1 and verse 26. I would argue this might be the theme verse for the entire book. If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but is deceived in his heart, this person's religion is worthless. We might think, we might say that we're religious, that we're faithful. But if our tongues betray those thoughts, our hearts are deceived. And there's no amount of works, there's no amount of obedience that, over, that can overcome the misspeak, the misuse of our tongues. And understanding that verse and that principle really helps us to understand the significance of chapter 3 and verse 1. Because before he gets into the, the illustrations and the warnings itself about the tongue, he first gives the command. There's only one command and really in all of chapter 3, verses 1 through 12, this tongue section. The command is verse 1. Listen to what it says. Not many of you should become teachers. My brothers, that sounds kind of counterintuitive, doesn't it? Don't, don't we want as many teachers in the church as possible? That is, that as soon as one is willing to step up and teach, we should let them. What does James say? He says, hold up. Not many of you should become teachers because, why? For you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. 
Why, why does that make sense? It makes sense in light of the principles of chapter 1 and verse 26. That the ability to bridle our tongue is so fundamental that so too the ones who take it upon themselves to teach the gospel must be sure their tongues are bridled in the act of teaching, but also in their lives outside of the act of teaching. It's a great privilege to teach the gospel. Therefore, it comes with great responsibility, great strictness. So it's this command that then sets up all this discussion about the tongue. So what's true in chapter 3, verses 2 through 12, is why 3 and verse 1 makes sense, but it's also general enough, generic enough, that it applies to every Christian and their use of our tongues and our speech. And we should remember here that our aim should be constructive, encouraging speech. Paul makes that clear in Ephesians 4. In verse 29, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up, as it fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. And you see, James, or Paul outlines it there in that verse, that we cannot build up one another if we are also corrupting one another with our speech. And so just as we would go to a doctor, a physician, his goal for us would be optimal health. We want you to be healthy overall. But then if he gets in and he runs some tests or he runs some scans and he says, listen, you've got something that's very acute and very dangerous and it'll cost you your life if we do not eradicate it. See, he can't bring us to optimal health until he first removes the thing that's most pressing and most urgent. So too, we cannot have a tongue and have a mouth that's uplifting and encouraging without first stopping the bleeding that comes from the misuse of our tongues. All right, let's dive into James chapter 3. We'll begin in verse 1 together. Or begin in verse 2, actually. We've already read verse 1. Let's go to verse 2. For we all stumble in many ways, and if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle his whole body. If we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also. They are so large and are driven by strong winds. They are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. Let's look at two key principles. What is it that he, he's building his case from here, the two principles. Number one, the tongue is small, but it does big things. That's the principle of verses two through five, the first half of verse five. The tongue is small, but it does big things. It's pretty difficult to come up with a list or an exact number of what we would call body parts. Just, there's so many different ways we could define that. But I saw one person who tried to come up with a list, and they suggested 286 was the number. So whether that's 286 or if it's 300 or whatever number we want to roll with, just imagine that, that collective number. How many body parts do we have? Now think of the tongue and its relative size to a lot of our body parts or organs. It's only about an average of three inches in length. It weighs two to two and a half ounces. It's not really one muscle. It's a collection of eight different muscles. It's designed similarly to an elephant's trunk or to tentacle of an octopus. Interestingly, it's the only muscle in our entire human bodies that's not directly attached to the skeletal system. It's got some freedom to it, right? And so even though it's so small, it's that freedom, it's lack of being attached that causes us to so often allow it to get us into great trouble. Jesus would echo this same thought. Matthew chapter 12, I tell you the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word they speak. For by your words you will be justified and by your words you will be condemned. You may think your tongue is small. It may physically be small. But our words, each of those we will give an account for how and when and why and what we said of them. So it's small. We cannot underestimate how big it can accomplish things. 
But next, let's keep reading in verse 5 and see the next principle in the text. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. Now we see that, that principle coming to light, that it's small but causes big things. But it also, verse 6, the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. Tongue is set against our members, standing the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird and of reptile and of sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. So just think of these word pictures, okay? You got the, the fire and the poison on the front end and the back end there. The fire kind of bridges both of these principles because it starts small and grows big. But imagine a raging wildfire. Imagine, imagine a fire that gets out of hand even at someone's yard, right? I mean, I remember growing up and people would, you know, teenagers would roll people's houses and then dad would go out there and just set the toilet paper on fire. And I had a friend or two that, that their parents did that and they set their whole yard on fire by trying to burn the toilet paper. And what, that, that kind of looks embarrassing for a time, but the next year they had the greenest yard in town. So maybe there was some benefit there. But just imagine a fire raging and someone coming along and trying to suppress it and trying to just blow it out, control it by hand. It gets to a point to where it's uncontrollable. Imagine poison dropped into someone's drink. You can't control it once it hits the substance. Once it's ingested, you can't control where it goes. It spreads and it spreads. It cannot be tamed. It's that idea of taming and bridling that comes to play with animals. We have the ability to tame, to some degree, every animal on earth. Now, we can't domesticate every animal on earth. There's some whales and some great white sharks. You know, we, we just come up short on that. But we still exercise our power over them. No matter how large they are, we can kill them. We can and we do kill them. But what does he say? Despite these great large animals that we've exercised our power over, we as human beings cannot tame the tongue. Even though it's small, it pales in comparison to those large animals, no human being can tame the tongue. Jesus also referenced this principle. Matthew chapter 15, what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this defiles a person. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, and slander. These are what defile a person. But I think we would do well to not be discouraged by James' point. Not only do we have a text like Ephesians 4, 29 that we read that shows us pure speech, uplifting speech as possible and is the goal. You also look at James chapter 3, the paragraph that follows. That's the exercise of wisdom can bring righteousness and peace. So that in and of itself should give us hope and say, well, this is possible for us to grow in our speech. But notice, even this text, there's glimmers of hope. Notice how specific he is. No human being can tame the tongue. Question. Can God tame the tongue? Did Jesus Christ tame and bridle his tongue? So with the power and the strength and the guidance of God, we can learn to have a tamed tongue and tamed speech. But on our own, if we go at it like we, kind of, we go at trying to tame animals, we will come up short. And I think there's this glimmer in one of these word pictures. Listen to what is said about the ship in the first section we read. The ship is beaten around and tossed around by the winds and the waves, and yet it goes wherever the rudder directs. Who guides the rudder? Did you notice it? In the text it says, where the will of the pilot directs tongues can guide our lives because they're connected to the heart who's directing our heart who's directing our tongues when God and Christ is our pilot we can grow in taming and directing our tongues and all that he would have us to do and I think this is in keeping with a principle from Matthew chapter 19 remember Jesus says there's no way the rich can enter heaven so the disciples say well who who then can be saved? Jesus says, with man this is impossible, but with God 
all things are possible. A man who trusts in riches will never enter the kingdom of heaven. But a man can be wealthy in his bank account as long as he trusts in God the most. And he can be saved. We all have a tongue that's a liability at times. And if we allow ourselves and our flesh to guide that tongue, then no, we will not be saved. But when we give control over to God, he can and he will guide us in all things, including how we speak, how we use our tongues. Then let's get to verse 9, as this introduces us to really his point of the passage. He's given us two principles to set us up. Tongue small, it does big things, and no human being on his own or her own can tame the tongue, but he can with the Lord's help. What's the point? What's the main idea he wants to land here with? Look at verse 9. With it, our tongue, we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. There's the point. Now he illustrates with more word pictures. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives, or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water says, if you're a Christian and you use your mouth for two different purposes, you're missing it. All your praising God is of no avail while you're using your same mouth to curse others. Matthew 12, earlier in the text that we read earlier, either make the tree good and its fruit good or make the tree bad and its fruit bad for the tree is known by its fruit. You brood of vipers, nest of vipers. How can you speak good when you're, you are evil? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The good person out of his good treasure brings forth good. The evil person out of his evil treasure brings forth evil. So when we misspeak against one another, we are misspeaking against God because every person is made in the image of God. There's no way to draw a line between the first greatest command to love God and the second likened to it, which is to love our neighbor. To rightly love God demands that we rightly love one another. To speak well of God demands that we also speak well of and speak well to one another. Jesus addressed this in Matthew 5, the Sermon on the Mount. Reminds us that to misspeak to one another is just as sinful as killing one another. You've heard that it was said of those, to those of old, you shall not murder. Whoever murders will be liable of judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. Whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. So to speak evil to one another, to speak evil against one another and about one another, to curse one another while trying to also bless and praise God, it cannot coexist. And all it proves is that we are allowing evil to reign in our hearts. So let's get as practical as we can for a few minutes, just as we wind things down a little bit. Let's ask, how do we then curse one another? What are some examples? And this list, no matter kind of which direction you take to find a list, it gets overwhelming and it gets, it gets kind of nauseating, right? That's, that's when the Lord is working on us through his word, is it, it gets difficult. We can look at a list and we would do well to see a whole list, but... We, we need to know. Let's start with one or two. Let's just circle and highlight one area that maybe we've struggled with clearly or maybe we've, we've already kind of fallen prey to it today or maybe we look back on today and we say, wow, how, how have I not done that one today? I, I do it almost every day. And that's the one to begin working on as we move through our growth in our speech. Let's look quickly at what cursing one another in James, the book of James, might look like when we are provoked to anger, 1, verses 19 and 20. When we show partiality by speaking differently to people of different social backgrounds, that's chapter 2. When we teach something that's false doctrine, like faith only without works, that would be cursing one another. When we say to a, someone in need, we hope you're warmed and filled, but you don't give them what they need, that's misusing the tongue, that's cursing one another. We quarrel and fight one another, that's chapter 4. We judge one another by speaking evil of one another. That's 411. We grumble against one another. Chapter 5, verse 9. And then 5, verse 12, we swear by keeping, not square by not keeping our words. 
But also the book of Proverbs is full of so many warnings about the misuse of speech. And the neat thing about Proverbs in this regard is that a single verse can contain the warning and also the solution. Here's what the foolish do, but here's what the wise do. And so when we find one that we say, oh, that's, that's strong for me right now. I've fallen prey to that temptation far too often when it comes to my speech. We can find that in Proverbs and very likely we'll find what to replace it with. So let's look at a few examples. We can tell too much. We can speak too much. Whoever restrains his words has knowledge. And he who has a cool spirit is a man of understanding. Even a fool who keeps silent is considered wise. When he closes his lips, he's deemed intelligent. Do you see a man who is hasty in his words? There is more hope for a fool than for him. Number two, we can be critical. We can be a verbal bully. Whoever belittles his neighbor lacks sense. But a man of understanding remains silent. There is one whose rash words are like sword thrusts. But the tongue of the wise brings healing. We can be too direct or too blunt. When words are many, transgression is not lacking, but whoever restrains his lips is prudent. The vexation of a fool is known at once, but the prudent ignores an insult. A fool gives full vent to his spirit, but a wise man quietly holds it back. And the heart of the righteous ponders how to answer, but the mouth of the wicked pours out evil things. Listen to those two verbs. The wise ponders the answer, but the wicked pours out. Pondering versus pouring. It sounds good to brag about this, but nowhere do you find in Scripture God honoring the attitude that says, well, I just tell it like it is. I just tell it like it needs to be told. No, no, God honors and elevates the ability to control our tongues, to bridle our tongues, to think before we speak. We can gossip, which is talking about someone instead of talking to them, talking about them instead of helping them. Whoever goes about slandering reveals secrets, but he who is trustworthy in spirit keeps a thing covered. Whoever meddles in a quarrel not his own is like one who takes a passing dog by the ears. For lack of wood, the fire goes out. And where there is no whisperer, quarreling ceases. We cannot say we love our neighbor while also speaking negatively about them. We can be insensitive and harsh. A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. A gentle tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness in it breaks the spirit. Listen to the specificity of this one. Whoever blesses his neighbor with a loud voice, rising early in the morning, will be counted as cursing. He uses the two words of James in chapter 3 and verse 9, blessing and cursing. And he says we can speak words of blessing, and yet we can say them in such a way that it ends up being cursing. Harsh tone, insensitive tone. Would I ever speak to God with the same tone that I use to speak to people sometimes? When I get crossways with my spouse and my voice elevates and I get critical, would I ever speak to God with that tone? Would I speak to God in the same tone that I use to get on to my children? Because, see, that's the connection James makes in James 3, isn't it? With it we bless God and with it we curse one another made in the image, the likeness of God. Connected to that, I suppose, is the idea of sarcasm. Like a madman who throws firebrands, arrows, and death is the man who deceives his neighbor and then says, oh, I'm only joking. Dishonesty, not speaking words of truth. False witness will not go unpunished, and he who pours out lies will not go free. Proverbs chapter 6, God hates he hates a lying tongue, a false witness, and sowing discord among brethren. 
Those are examples of how we curse God, but we do need to un uphold the standard of praising God. Just because he says don't be hypocritical in that does not negate the need to praise God. That should be our standard. It should be such that we praise God in worship. We praise God with our tongues directly. But then also when we speak to one another, those are words that also are blessing God. So how do we do that? Quickly, I love what happens in chapter 51 of Psalms. This is what we commonly think of as one of David's main repentance psalms. And most associated with that sin with Bathsheba and then killing of Uriah. And after he finds repentance and forgiveness from God, listen to what, what is seen in his response. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Uphold me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach. Then I will teach transgressors your ways. Sinners will return to you. Do you hear it? What's happened on the inside is now reflected where? In my words and my speech, my teaching. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God. O God of my salvation and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. David says, I see forgiveness, I see repentance. And when I have that broken heart that God mends and repairs, and I have the change that happens within, the transformation, it will be seen in my tongue, my lips, my words. I also love how Psalm number 19 closes, the last verse of it. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock, my redeemer. How did he get there? I love that single verse, but I love also being able to connect it to the whole psalm because it's a 14-verse psalm, verses 1 through 6. Talk about how the speech of God comes forth in his world. So David is saying, listen, you want words and meditations that are pleasing to God? You first listen to God and you listen to him in his created world. You look at his natural laws and you listen and you pause and you take in all that he makes available in the created world. Then you get to chapter 19, verses 7 through 13. And he turns his attention toward the revealed word of God. You listen more and more to God's inspired word. You look at his world and listen, and you look at his word and listen. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The way to grow in praising God and using our tongues in a way that praises God is to listen more than we talk. And specifically to listen to God first and most. We can look into the created world and listen. We can look into his word and listen and keep listening. And thus have the vocabulary and the desire and the humility to let our words and our meditations be acceptable in his sight and in all things. Tonight, if you're not a disciple of Jesus Christ, there's no better words. There are no better words that you could say. Then to say that I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that he died for my sin, that he rose from the grave, I'm willing to turn from my old life of sin and die to self, and I need to be baptized for the forgiveness of my sins. I need to be raised up to walk in a new life that follows Jesus Christ. If you've not said those words and not carried out those actions, let tonight be the night you do that. Maybe you've wandered away from God, you're living a life that does not bring glory to his name, there are words that you could say. There's no better words you could say than to say, I'm sorry, Lord, that I've hurt you with my sin. Please forgive me. I'm coming back home to you. If you need to say either of those things, if you, we can help you in any other way, know that we're here for you and with you. Use this time to come now as we sing. Jesus, will save me.